His relationship with Muhammad Ali, who was still a young Cassius Clay when they first met, brought together the greatest boxer and the outstanding commentator. I was a very lucky man to have had this remarkable relationship with Ali over many, many years, almost 20 years. I could walk into his camp and I would know that he would give me the interview I wanted. I knew that he would say the things that I would want him to say. I never had to tell him what to say. He knew what to say. He knew exactly what I wanted. And there was never any uh, acrimony between us. There was never any payment between us. We had all those interviews, all that wonderful stuff that he did for BBC television. That all came from him. He did it because he liked us. I feel awful lucky to be with me taking this interview. Most people I don't take much time with. But you all fellas are so nice, I'll give you this time. That's very kind of you, and we appreciate it. Well, we're going to have a little old game of uh, English croquet, and I'm going to play the world champ. I'm an Englishman, I don't even know how to play it. Well, so. yes, I know all about this game. I've been playing this game ever since I was a kid. Okay. No, you have to hit the peg. OK, you I'll must, take it back. You must hit this. Well, nice playing with you, and the next time I challenge you to a game of croquet, I understand you have a nice place over there where we can play called Roehampton. That's right. That is, is that the great place. It? Exactly Great right. Roehampton. That's a date. Well, I will be there to beat you in one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go on here. What about that night, the middle of the night, when you turned up uh, at Sonny Liston's own home? Oh, yes. That was in uh, Denver, Colorado. We went to his house one night before the signing of the contract in Denver, and I drove my bus in his front yard and told him that I uh, blew my air horn, woke him up, and he came out in the middle of the night in his underclothes, his robe, and he had a big stick. And he said, you get out of my yard. And I said, you big, ugly bear, you. I'm going to see you tomorrow for the signing, and I'm going to knock you out in eight. Nobody much liked Sonny Liston. He didn't court popularity. His lack of education and his earlier reputation as a man at odds with society made communication difficult. But without doubt, the boxing world and the public respected him as champion. You tell me how you think the fight will go, Sonny. How oh, I think it should go, mm -hmm. will go yep. like all the rest of them. One round? I'm, that's what I'm planning for. You ever been a kid when you start talking loud or singing loud or something to amuse yourself so that you won't get scared and run out? This is what we call whistling in the dark. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what Clay does. But when the bell sounds and he comes to me, I don't know what he might do. So far, nothing much in it. But from now on, it becomes one of the most extraordinary and puzzling fights of all time. Clay didn't want to come out for this round. He's complaining there's something in his eyes that he can't see properly. He believes it's something that's come off Liston's gloves. He's only in there now because Angelo Dundee, his trainer, shoved him out for the fifth and told him to get on with it. I'll swear that not one of us in that Miami Beach arena could have predicted what would happen next. A hundred different theories have been advanced as to why this fight ended so strangely. Most of them are libelous. The most charitable theory is that Liston was telling the truth and that his shoulder was bad. A more cynical explanation is that he knew by this time he was in for a beating and he couldn't face it. Sonny, 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 what happened? Get up, the bell rung, Sonny, get up. Don't quit. Sonny said, my mother did not raise no food. I'm gonna stay right here on my stool. And what's happened? Clay has won! Clay has won! It's all over at the end of the fifth round, and Cassius Clay is the new champion of the world! Sonny, how much did it hurt you when you lost that title? Damn it. More than words can explain. It's just over a week since Cassius Clay won the heavyweight title. People all over the world are still talking about this amazing character. I feel real good. I've always uh, said that I was the uncrowned champion, and I always had the feeling that I was the champion. As a matter of fact, I knew I was the champion before the fight. There are still a lot of people, both uh, here and in America, who simply can't believe that the fight was fair and above board. What do you say about that, Cass? Well, a lot of people say that the fight was fixed, it was funny, only because of the shock of losing all of their money. You have a fellow over there who knocked me down, and I don't like it, and I haven't forgot it, and he really embarrassed me, and I want to show the world that he's nothing either, and I want to give him a shot at my crown, that Henry Cooper. I want him right there in London, England. Well, Henry Cooper is keener than ever to have a shot with you. I'm looking for him, too. Britain met him for the first time in 1963. He wasn't champion yet, but he was already world famous. The man who predicted the round and always seemed to be right. He was here to fight Henry Cooper. He caught me in the corner and he hit me with a left hook. 
And it was a hard one. The bell has sounded, and he's up at about three, Clay. That was the end of the fourth round, and he hit him about two seconds before the end of the round. With the left hook, Clay took one chance too many, and he still doesn't know where he is. They're working furiously on him in the corner. Angelo Dundee is trainer. He really is giving him a talking to. Now oh, this crowd at Wembley are beginning to bay for a Cooper win. Clay on the floor at the end of the fourth, and now fighting to preserve his professional life here against Henry Cooper. Cooper's left eye is really in a shocking state. It really is now. And I think Tommy Little will have to stop this because Cooper's eye is really in an absolutely appalling state. And now he's slipping in and I think this is it. Cooper, of course, couldn't go on. To this day, we still like to play the game of pretending what might have happened if Cooper had hit him a little earlier in the fourth. What might have been didn't matter. Clay had said five rounds, and five rounds it was, whether we liked it or not. Henry had given Clay his final test. I don't think any of us, maybe not even Clay, imagined that he'd be world champion in another eight months. Cass, who's that you've got there with you in the New York studio? Come here, Sam. Uh, yeah. Mr. I got the British press here. Mm -hmm. This is Sam Cook. As you can see, like me, he's awful pretty. <laughs> and we are here now working on a record called The Gang's All Here. Would you like to give us uh, a preview of this disc? Uh, well, let's give him a sound. Come on, let's give him a preview. Audio. We, we'll do a lot better if we had the music here with us. All right, but we're going to do it. We'll, we'll try music. now. Hey, hey, the gang's all here. Join in the fun. Hey, hey, the gang's all here. We're going to swing as one. Do it again now. Hey, hey, the gang's all here. Join in the fun. Hey, hey, the gang's all here. We're going to swing as one. Yeah. How you like that? <laughs> and I'll see you guys later. All right, Sam. Yes, sir. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, Cass. You're welcome. Bye-bye. The sun is fantastic. I'm not used to this sort of weather. From the movies I see, England seems to be a rather dreary place. You know, damp, cool. <laughs> we survive. Yeah, I see. I don't guess you live to be this old for nothing. <laughs> This is what we call uh, filling the gas tank. In other words, getting up early in the morning, coming out, getting your legs in shape, getting your wind. And we get up every morning. This is the most important thing about a fighter. You see those large boots he have on? We travel with those because uh, lifting the weights fill up, build the ankles and the legs and everything. When you take those off and put those boxing trunks on, you have a little two little invisible wings, I would say. This is the part that the, uh, the, the ladies and gentlemen and the kids in the world don't see. The average fella don't even want to get up in the morning. He's pretty well uh, talked up there. He's got a lot yeah. of gear on. Well, he got, he got a rubber suit under that sweatsuit, you know, by him not fighting but once a year, you know. He get a little tummy and then get a little large in the back there a little bit. And that sweatsuit sweated down. When he take it off, he probably have a... A quart of water under there. Those are the things that people don't see. He says the boasting and the predicting are over. But when the public's eye is on him, he can seldom resist playing to the gallery. And even when he's meeting old friends for the umpteenth time, if a camera or microphone's around, he'll succumb. I am the greatest. Andrew, tell us just what is it that makes him a great champion? Well, actually, in uh, training, he does hardly nothing. I mean, and, then, and that's a broad statement, but he doesn't work too hard in the gym. He just works to get condition. So one day, uh, I hit a fellow a punch, and there was not even anything like a left uppercut. And I said, gee, when he slipped your punch and you hit him with a left uppercut, I thought it was beautiful. And he says, yeah, it was pretty good, wasn't it? And that, then he started using a left uppercut to effect. You've got to get to him by a roundabout way. I have something that I would like to introduce to the people there in Britain, all of my boxing fans. I know many of you have read about and have heard, 
And if you saw the Williams fight, you saw me uh, reveal the Ali Shuffle. That's my new dance to the world. This Ali Shuffle is something that's sweeping the nation throughout America. Old people, young people, ladies, men, all throughout the colleges, everywhere that I have toured since the Williams fight, they're trying to do the Ali Shuffle. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the regular dance that I use just before the shuffle. I'm moving and I'm moving and I'm jumping around and just before you know it, that's the Ali Shuffle from the side beat. See, that's the side beat. And then this is the Ali Shuffle from the front beat. And just as soon as you do that shuffle, a split second, right after that shuffle, it's a good punch. And it's the Ali Shuffle. What about this fight coming up uh, with Terrell? Well, what's your prediction on it? Terrell will catch hell at the sound of the bell. Ernie Terrell thinks he's a championship fighter, but when he meets me, he will fall 20 pounds lighter. He may come in the ring looking clean and neat, but if he's not cool, they will carry him out by his feet. Now, he's going around saying that he's the real heavyweight champ, but after I'm finished, he will only be a tramp. Now, I don't want to be a drag, and I'm not here to brag, but it's Terrell's jaw I'm out to tag. Now, I understand he wants to stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and with me, trade blow for blow. But if he's hip, he will take a dip, because I plan to bust his lip. And after the fight, he will know he was in a scuffle, because he couldn't master the Ali Shuffle. <laughs> Surprised you, huh? That's the best yet. <laughs> Surprised you, huh? That's a long prediction, huh? <laughs> Call me Muhammad Ali, not Cassius Clay. What's my name? He's asking him, what's my name? In the middle of a World Heavyweight Championship fight. What's my name? He says it over and over again. I want to know my name. And Terrell goes for him after the bell. Oh dear, this, this is not sport. And he completely changed his opinion about Terrell overnight. Well, it might have been, as he said, that he cooled down, but I think it's rather more likely uh, that the people behind him, who are the Muslims, and in particular Herbert Mohammed, who's now his manager, I think it's very likely that they got hold of him overnight and said, look, you're destroying what little good public image you've got left, and you've got to change this, and you've now got to give Terrell a little credit. It all made for fascinating viewing. The most famous sportsman ever, and the bespectacled journalist and commentator together. And Ali's greatest moments were Harry's greatest too. Fifteen hours ago, I left the ringside of Madison Square Garden, New York, carrying with me the videotape recording of one of the most extraordinary fights of all time. Now I'm in London to share with you the boxing experience of a lifetime, the amazing multi-million dollar battle of champions between Joe Frazier and Cassius Clay for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. All Joe Frazier's relying on is a couple of good hooks. What are you trying to tell me? This is the biggest fight of all time, and it could be one of the best of all time. And it's impossible for Joe Frazier to outbox our point, Muhammad Ali. He'll have to knock me out to win, and that's still impossible. Here's Muhammad Ali, the man who tries tonight to regain the title that he never lost in the ring. He just, like a machine, he just keep coming, looking for hooks, and he, he, everybody hit him. He's, he's hit so easy, he gets angry if you miss him. Show me what you'll be doing, Wally. <laughs> the perfect match, because they're both unbeaten. Oh, he'll be coming in, you know, and I'll be taking my time and keeping my distance on my toes, staying in arm range, I'm taller than he, and <laughs> Get a little too close, grab him, tie him up, you know, clinch him, walk with him, you know. <laughs> just walk him all around. He got his little phony ways about him, you know what I mean? But as far as I'm concerned, he's all right with me. This contest is for the final determination of the heavyweight championship of the world. Why don't you ever have any doubts that somebody no doubt. might beat you? How can I lose with the stuff I use? <laughs> I mean, no doubt. I was a slow, flat-footed, ugly, slow, awkward Joe Frazier going to whip Mohammed Ali. If he dreamed it, he better wake up and apologize. But I noticed that you let him call you Clay. I didn't let him call yes, me Clay. Did. He called me Clay. Right. Now, I'm going to stop all of that, too. I'm going to do him just like I did the rest of them. What's my name? <laughs> Don't you never my call me that no more. That's what I'm going to do to him. And it's noticeable that the talking has stopped. Clay's got his work cut out now with this fight, and he knows it. And Fraser this time snarls back at Clay as Clay catches him to the head. I don't know what he said, but obviously he was showing contempt for punches.
that's a tremendous shout for Muhammad Ali. He's got the crowd going with him, and he motions to Fraser and says, listen, they're rooting for me. Fraser really goes after him, and he's got him with a left hook. He's done it once too often, Clay's in trouble. Round 11, he's hurt, he nearly went down. Here's the first great climax of this fight. The left hooks are thundering in. And Clay's in trouble and he makes a face. It's a big round for Frazier. And he's hurt again and he almost goes over. Clay's in real trouble. Now he really needs, needs to move. Now is he foxing or is he really hurt? He's hurt. Tremendous round for Frazier. The bell's coming up. Oh, and Clay's play acting again. He pretends he's hurt. And Clay was hurt, but not hurt as much as he was trying to make out. And Angelo Dundee shouts at him and says, what are you doing? Oh, there it is! The left hook. Frazier's at last caught up with him. Tremendous left hook. And Clay is fighting for survival. It's very interesting that uh, even people who don't follow boxing, when you say to them, uh, the rumble in the jungle, and their face like, the rumble in the jungle, they all remember, or even if they weren't, weren't born then, they know about it. If you think I whoop Sonny Liston, you wait till I get George Foreman. He talks too much, he's ugly, he's pretending I'm the true champion, and they make me the underdog, I'm gonna show them all they're wrong, because I'm the champion, I'm the real champion. There'll never be one like me. And all of you people in Britain who rank me as the greatest, I'm gonna prove I'm the greatest, I'm gonna prove to you I'm the greatest, we gonna prove to the world I'm the greatest, this is my last fight, I don't want none of you to miss it, so please come to the theaters. I'm going to eat some raw meat, and I'm going to train, I'm going to get ready and chop some more trees. George at that time wasn't the sort of a vunker, a nice bloke he is today, all smiles and cheer. He was very gloomy and he was very... He, he didn't much care for being interviewed. Yes. Good, good boy. Good this boy. is your own dog, is it? Yeah, this is Dago. He was very prickly. He, he had this uh, huge Alsatian which he used to call Doggo or Dago. I can't remember now. And that was lying by his side, and you felt, you know, if you're not careful in this injury, he's going to set that dog on you. <laughs> Ali, Bumaye, Ali, Bumaye, Ali. I think the media was generally in agreement that uh, Foreman was going to be too tough an opponent. Foreman stares him right in the eyes with a real look of menace. The most expensive fight in the history of boxing is on its way. Get off the ropes, they're saying to Ali. Again and again, Ali intends to stay on the ropes, which is very surprising. There's always a feeling that at some point, Foreman's going to throw a punch, which will do for Ali. The body punch is absolutely ripping into the ribs of Ali. I mean, he allowed Foreman to come to him and belt him. He lay on the rope, did the rope a dope, as he used to call it. He lay on the ropes and he let Foreman pummel him for round after round. And there is real violence in that ring, believe me, there's hatred. It was the most extraordinary few seconds that I've ever seen in the boxing ring. And when he did, and so sensationally, and in the end so 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 quickly, one punch, uh, when it happened, I mean, it, it just came out. My God, he's got the title back at 32. Ali is heavyweight champion of the world. And it's nice to be able to say I was there when this absolutely extraordinary fight took place. Oh, it was a thriller in Manila. <laughs> that was the hardest fight I ever saw.
And that was the one I disliked most because it, it was too hard. Fraser's mouth badly busted now. A lot of blood coming from Fraser's mouth. Oh. Ali looking unmarked. And when you've got two men with 15, 16 stone knocking each other about for 14 rounds, you know, they are shipping a lot of punishment. And somebody in that corner wants to stop the fight. Somebody in Frazier's corner is saying he ought to be stopped. They're arguing about it. And Eddie Futch is calling it off. He's calling it off. It's all over, and Muhammad Ali at the end of the 14th round is a TKO now. He did it in the end, the hardest fight of his life. And Frazier, in the end, had to quit, and Ali's out on his back in the ring. He's collapsed. And I'm having to hoist him off the floor and get him back to his corner. It was a too hard a fight, and it was the point at which he should have said, that's it, I've beat my old enemy, Joe Fraser. It was the third fight they'd had. And uh, now's the time to call it a day, I would have said. But then, you know, you, I don't know exactly what his personal circumstances were. He may have needed more money. I, I don't know. Uh, or maybe it's just too hard when you're the world champion. Uh, there's always the temptation. Just one more, I can beat this guy. One more, one more. For 20 wonderful working years of my life, I've followed this man around the world and reported his achievements. He took boxing to heights never previously reached. He coined his own epitaph, I am the greatest. He was, and he is, the people of Britain have voted Muhammad Ali the sports personality of the century. Harry Carpenter was one of the outstanding communicators in the history of sports broadcasting. He simply knew how to do it very well indeed. Basically, the art of television commentary, it's totally different from radio commentary, but the art of television commentary is to say as little as possible, and when you do speak, to be as helpful as you can. Exactly right. There was an era in sports broadcasting which produced great commentators. John Arlott in cricket, Bill McLaren in rugby union, Dan Maskell in tennis, Sir Peter O'Sullivan in racing among them. Harry was in that special league and was probably more versatile than any of them. But boxing was his first love. He knows he can hurt him now. Get in there, Frank. Let me leave the last word to the greatest with whom Harry shared such historic and unforgettable times. Goodbye. Just before, just before we... Go ahead. No, you just, can go. Just, <laughs> just before we close this interview, give us some idea of what you think uh, is happening with Joe Fraser. When do you think you might fight him again? Well, number one, he's too ugly to be the world heavyweight champion. <laughs> Joe Fraser. Joe Fraser is so ugly, his face should be donated to the Bureau of Wildlife. <laughs> that man, that man, let me tell you. He can't write no poems, he can't predict no rounds, and let me tell you, I'm not conceited, I'm just convinced. <laughs> Harry, listen, I'm so modest, I can, admit my, I can admit my own fault, and my only fault is, I don't realize how great I really am. <laughs> Ali, will will take it for granted, we know, we know what you can do. <laughs> Ali, thank you thank very you. much. You're, I like to say that you're not as dumb as you look, Harry. <laughs> Ali, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye.